Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you, those of you who have come back, for coming back. I um, um, just want to introduce uh, Emily's parents. Tell me again. Evan. Evan and Sean. Sean, who have come from Michigan to visit this week, so we're glad to have you all with us. And we're glad to have, someone. they came just for this? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they did. So we're glad to have you all, as well as everybody else. So let's open in prayer. And we'll get going. Father, we come before you this morning. We're thankful for the beauty of your creation, for the bright sunshine, Lord. We look forward to warmer days, but uh, we certainly appreciate the way you provide for us and have given us so much uh, that even in, in the cold, we can be warm. And uh, we just thank you for your goodness and your grace to us. We thank you that we can gather today. We ask you to be here with us, that you would um, be glorified in every word that's spoken that you'd give Marsha and me insight as we share, and then the group insight as they receive and as they share as well. We pray that um, your name would be exalted and that all we do would be done to honor you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right, we're going to do a quick review as, um, as we kind of like to do. And we're going to throw a lot of stuff at you, a lot of, especially a lot of scripture today. So you may just have to jot it down and hopefully read it later. But... Um, we didn't really realize we were going to do this in two weeks last year, and now it's been three weeks, and um, so here we are. But we just wanted to ask first, remember, who are we serving? And um, it's always, it's, our service is not for the church, that so we're going to talk about service for the church today, and it's for the Lord Jesus Christ. About being eager, that, has, that was kind of a word that kept coming up last year. When I taught Ephesians, it was in Ephesians, and then... Uh, Mary Moeller wrote a book last year about Susanna Spurgeon, and its little subtitle is Lessons for a Life of Joyful Eagerness in Christ. And there's a, I wanted to read this little quote from a devotion that uh, Mrs. Spurgeon wrote, and it says, O Lord, pity me and pardon me. Awaken my soul to an earnest sense of the solemn responsibility involved in belonging to you and bearing your name. Rouse in me, Lord, a joyful eagerness to become all that you wish me to be. Fill me with that mighty influence which works in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Yet chasten and afflict me, Lord, if nothing else will serve to make me a partaker of your holiness. So in, in talking about our service to the Lord and to the church and to others, just, just that whole eagerness. And that eagerness comes from a heart um, whose affections and attitude are totally focused on the Lord and his word. Um, we talked a minute about the difference between works and service, and service is something that comes from our heart, and the works come from our hands, and that will change through the seasons of life. Um, we talked about, again, Pastor Will's sermon about the calculation of our services and works, and um, I was thinking, so Sir Frankfurt is in a couple of Saturdays, and we've been asked to do something for our family that day. And so, do you serve your family? Do you serve Frankfurt? There's always that good calculation, as somebody mentioned, plus the calculation of um, just is it my will or what needs to be done. And we talked about last week those centrifugal, centrifugal circles working from inside yourself um, so that you have the energy, the source, the living water to then serve others, and then working outside to your, your home and your family and those around you. So we are going to go on and start this week. And um, as we were taking notes last week during Chris's sermon, we said we could just play his sermon for this last class. So if you look over your notes. Um, well, we didn't plan that. No. I mean, this, no. this, this was not planned. So somebody commented after the sermon, after church last week, mm -hmm. it's, it's really cool how what we're doing here in class is kind of right lined up. But we started out, this was originally on First and Second Timothy and Titus. He's doing Philippians, and we see that the way they go together, and the timing is great. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but, that was not planned. But So in your notes, I went, we went ahead and put in some of the scripture just so we can save some time. But... When we talk about service within the church, I wanted to spend a minute just talking about how the church, how, how the church of Jesus Christ is established. 
And if you just go to Ephesians 2, 9, and 10, this is the way we become members of the church. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So before the creation of time, we have been um, the good works that we are to do as a result of his good work in us have been, have been ordained. And then in Ephesians 2.18, it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So each one of us is one of those, um, we'll read about it in a minute, we're each a part of that church that, had, that we are the body of Christ, he is the head, and it is for unity. And then if you go to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, um, I won't read all of it, but if you go to the very last part that's a, in your outline, it says, um, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that built, it builds itself up in love. So that's each one of us. We are each one of those joints. We are each one of those parts of the body. We are um, joined together to, under Christ. And if one of us isn't serving the way we should, as you know, you all have heard that, some part of the body isn't working. But if you look at the way it is, um, it's we grow and it's every joint and the whole body. So it's everyone. It's not just the pastors. It's not just teachers. It's not just the old people or the young people. It's everyone. So our service in the church is to do all of that. We are under Christ, the head. We are all part of the body, the church. It isn't just Buck Run. Um, we are church, you know, it's the eternal church that from, from the first believer to the last believer, we are part of that. And we are being built into a temple and we each have a role to play and a way to serve. Okay, so um, we, we kind of switched the last two verses in your outline. Uh, I want to point you to Ephesians 4.28 and ask you a question. I, I'm going to read the, the verse in a minute, but um, as I read it, think about this. What is the purpose of our work? And what I mean by work in this, in this context is our livelihood. What is the purpose of the work we do for our livelihood? And so let me read Ephesians 4.28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So why is it that we, why is it that we go out there and labor and earn a paycheck every week? So we can give to others. Partly, yeah. And so this is in the context of the thief no longer stealing, but I think we can, we can safely apply to ourselves that um, as we go do our work, obviously we work because we need income. We need to be able to pay for our food and our rent and everything. But there's also that piece that, that he talks about here about sharing with anyone in need. So how do we do that? How can we share with someone in need? What do we have to do before we can share with someone in need? We have to earn income, but what else? We have to see the need. So that's my point. How do we see the need? We need to be in a relationship. Relationship, community, involved, um, asking questions knowing the people around you. Because if we, if we don't know the, the people, we're not gonna know their need, and we're not gonna be able to share with them. And I would argue that this also talks about not only sharing financially, but sharing our time. I um, the side of that too is being willing to share when you have a need. Because others can't meet a need if you're too proud to admit mm -hmm. you have a need. So telling others, right. that's fair. Yeah, I think that's fair. And, and that's a, good, a great point, because if, if there's no one to serve, how can we serve? And so either pride or in, you know, to independence or a lot of things can keep people from, I had a friend once that said, let people help you so, so that we can't get a blessing if we can't serve. Right. So yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Great point. 
Right. It does go both ways. Right. Right. Okay. okay so uh, we, we said a moment ago um, that this sermon series Chris is preaching and our class weren't planned. That wasn't part of the plan. But let's look at Philippians 2 very briefly um, where, where Chris has made the point and we see in Scripture we have an obligation to look out for the interests of others. And again, how do we do that? Relationship. We are to serve the Lord without complaining or grumbling. Um, we talked about the need to serve yourself. In other words, we need to be saved. We need to be in the word. We need to grow. We need to be praying, not only for ourselves, but for others. And then I want to just make a point about last week's sermon in particular. Last week, um, he talked about the model citizen and who would you want to follow, right? And he laid out seven or eight points. Trust, uh, someone who, we want to follow someone who demonstrates a trust in God in all areas of life, humility, or what he, I think he said, self-forgetfulness, um, genuine care for others, relationship, right? Proven faithfulness or a track record, someone who models Christ, serves Christ, and follows Christ. Isn't that the model for us? So if, if we want to follow someone who meets all these characteristics, who lives these characteristics, shouldn't we also want to be the one that someone else will follow? And so this, this speaks not only to, to our mentors, but also to our mentees. And my assumption then would be that we ought to have people who, men, who, who look to us as an example. And scripture calls us to do that. Um, so all of these characteristics, all these attributes, are, as Marcia said earlier, all part of the body of Christ, and they all work together. If you go back up to um, Ephesians 4, I think it's verse 16, it says, when each part is working properly. So there's an assumption there. It's, it doesn't say if each part, it says when. So there's an assumption that each part will work properly, which makes the body grow, the body being the church of of Christ, the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we're also called in, in uh, 1 Timothy 2.2 2, to pray and pray specifically that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Uh, then in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he goes into the qualifications of um, overseers or pastors and into the qualifications for deacons. So let's touch on those just a moment. And when we kind of talked about them earlier, but 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And I'm not going to read the entire scripture, but I want to hit some highlights. So he says about a pastor... They must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, and so on, right? Not a lover of money. He must manage his own house, household well, um, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. You guys back there? Um, and then when he talks about deacons, he says a deacon in, in verse 8, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued. What does that mean? Right, okay. Um, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Um, and it goes on. They must hold the mystery of faith of the faith with a clear conscience. Let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things Herschel has always said, and I think Chris has adopted it as well, is that Buck Ron elects deacons, but for the most part, the people who are elected deacons are already serving anyway. And so they're to serve as deacons, and deacons have a specific number of different roles. But that's what we all, I mean, in a sense, we're all deacons with a lowercase d anyway, because we're serving the Lord, and we're called to do that. So, you know, a lot of churches get all hung up on, you know, well, they don't have women deacons or this or that, and we don't need, that's not the purpose of this class, but I, I just want to say this. Being a deacon is a title. But we all have that same title. We are all called to the same service. And uh, so I think all these little arguments that a lot of churches or people get into, 
are really irrelevant because we're all called to the same service, male, female, young and old, you know, we all are. Um, okay, and then I want to say one other thing. There, and we're going to talk later, there are all kinds of ways we can serve. And it occurred to me, um, we had a deacons meeting last Wednesday night, and one of the things they asked the deacons to do was to park in the gravel lot to make space out here because we're, we're being over-parked, basically. And so the last people who come who are oftentimes visitors end up getting either no parking space or they end up over there. So they've asked the deacons to park over here. That service, even, even something as tiny as where you're going to park your car is an act of service. And so we can do it without grumbling, without complaining, all those things, you know. Uh, and that's really the model for all of us. So you all need to park over there next week. Okay. <laughs> Except for you two. You all can park wherever you want. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, 1 Timothy 4, 8 through 10. We just going to, let me get over there. Okay, um, while bodily training, while bodily training uh, is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. It holds promise for the present life and also for the, val- for the life to come. Um, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. And then in verse 10, I want to point this out. For to this end we toil and strive, this is verse 10, For to this end we toil and strive, because we have set our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So why do we toil and strive? Why do we work? Because of the hope we have in our living God, right? Um, So that's our purpose. That's our entire purpose. 1 Timothy 4.11 continues, um, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example. There we go. We want to be an example, right? In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Now, in each of these Scriptures, it's, it's not enough to just read what we've outlined and what we've, what we've provided in the outline. If you keep reading, uh, verse 14 says... Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. So we're we're commanded to use our gifts, to not neglect our gifts, which means finding a place of service. Um, And then 1 Timothy 6, 11 and 12. So let's turn the page to chapter 6. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, meaning um, love of money, all the things up in verse 9 and 10. Um, False teachers, love of money, and so forth. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. But then again, if we read on to verse 18, it says, Be rich in good works. Be rich in good works, be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for for yourself as a good foundation for the future so that they may may take hold of that which is truly life. So in each of these cases, we see the call to service, we see the standard that's set for us of service, and we see the reason or the purpose behind that service. Um, And then finally, I want to go to... um, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 22. So flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And then, if you jump to verse 25, um, 
Okay, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And then, and then there's a why statement. It doesn't say why or it doesn't say that or in order that. But it says, God may perhaps grant them repentance. So why do we do all these things? To lead others to Christ, which is really our whole purpose, right? To glorify God and to, 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 to share the gospel, to, to draw others to him. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that all lead to being a good servant in Christ. Uh, all right. Marsha, you're up. I okay. Think. Uh, I just want to read briefly a few things in Titus, which is, is, is not only, um, it just adds to Timothy. But in Titus 1, he says, be above report, reproach, um, be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled. In Titus 2, he says, be sober-minded, steadfast. Um, talks about older women and older men. Be models, as Armando said earlier, of good works um, to younger people. And then chapter 3 talks about not being quarreling, be gentle, um, be perfect, perfect courtesy toward all people. How many of you have ever done that? And to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Hmm. Um, but it's just all of these, these characteristics and these things. And, he, and he, it doesn't say may or, it, I mean, it's, it, it just says that's the way we should be. And then we talked about earlier, the very first, about um, that very last part of Titus in verse 314, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. That, is, that all seems really daunting. If you go to the back of your outline, there's a list of um, all the things we need to be. It's, it's a pretty remarkable list. Um, and I won't go through it, but most of those came from those scriptures in either Ephesians, Timothy, or Titus. And it's, it, it's just amazing that that could be required by the Lord. But I want to point you to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. And it says, may the God of peace, so may God, and what did he do? who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. So who did it? God. What did he do? He raised Jesus. You know, it's a good, a good week to talk about that. And what will he do for us? He will equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may, be, and may he work in us that it's... Is that right? Equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we've got that list. It, it's like, I cannot do that. Um, we're not supposed to do that. We are supposed to depend on, um, on God to equip us. There's a, we picked up this book, and then we lost it, and then we found it again. It's serve, we well, lose, someone else found it for We us. lose a lot of things. Um, serve as Jesus served. And it talked about a lady who was in training, a lady in a church who was training another person to be a counselor within the church. And the woman had been a counselor for a long time. And she was training this other person. And then she remembered that she was just as needy in depending on God even after all of her years of experience as that brand new person she was training. And isn't that just a really neat thought? Um, it's kind of like when we talked about preach, teach, talk, remember the gospel to yourself every day. We should never get into such an independent mindset that we're not depending on the Lord for anything, even if, he, um, even if we've done it for a long time. So this book says, it doesn't matter if we're new Christians or have followed Christ for many years. From the first day we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have needed his, <clears throat> excuse me, his constant and steady supply of grace, strength, wisdom, and insight every hour. We always will. Sometimes we forget that the Bible tells us I don't know why I got so hoarse, that we are always in need of God's supernatural grace and strength for every task we undertake whether we're training for a counseling ministry, um, 
such as Mandy or a veteran counselor like Emily, our inner spiritual needs are the same. Certainly, we grow, gain experience, and mature, but our inner spiritual posture should always be one of humility and complete dependence on God. As we take on a humble and dependent posture before the Lord, we'll be able to watch our anxiety slip away. Any good we do is because God is doing the work in us and through us. I mean, that's just a good reminder. It's a good reminder, the Timothy verse, don't look down on someone who is young. We're, we're basically all still there. Yes, we're mature maybe in our spiritual walks. We have kind of further along in our road to sanctification. We understand the word more, but we still need Jesus just, and the Holy Spirit just like we did at the beginning. And, and that, that's what we need to remember one, when we are called to serve, when we're asked to serve, or when we look at lists like these and think, there's no way, I mess up, I can't do those every day. We can't, but the Lord can. And so always just depend on him. It seems, it seems to me that the, um, the older I get, and I'm getting older, uh, the older I get, the more I realize how much I need the Lord. And I think specifically, you know, going back to that verse, uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, where it says, um, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. And I think of times, uh, and my family knows, times I've lashed out at a waitress because I wasn't, we, we weren't getting, you guys remember that? Uh, we're out for a nice family dinner, and I kind of ruin it because we weren't getting the service that I thought we needed to get and I lash out at the waitress. It was and like I the think, first time we went out to eat after COVID. Yeah, so they were it was like bad. understaffed. It was, I mean, it was, it was, it was bad. I mean, it was bad. I was wrong. And, um, but you know, what, what I thought of when I read that verse in reviewing again for today's class is that I need to make that one of my memory verses. Um, because sometimes I'm, you know, I'm a little hot tempered and I don't need to be. Uh, particularly in, in cases like that where I could show kindness to somebody and grace, but my, my um, instinct was not to do it, at least in that case. And there are other examples I could point you to, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm sure Marsha or the kids probably could. Or our uh, C and, group. And our he C confesses group. to our C group our C like group every two weeks. knows a few things about Walmart and other things like that. <laughs> anyway, um, but how does, how does all of this play into our work in the church, our service in the church, right? So we need to seek to live a holy, godly life. We need to seek to learn and know scripture. Can I say something about that? I just was telling Ben, when I, a few weeks ago we were working on this class and I Googled something and this answer starts typing itself on my computer. I'd never had that happen before. Do you know what it was? AI. So I, I Googled a Bible verse or a whatever, a phrase from the Bible, and it just typed in all of this stuff. And that was very frightening to me because I thought, you know, if I didn't know better, I would just think that was the Word of God and how it was supposed to, to be explained. And, and I, so, so the thing about knowing Scripture I think is just grows more and more important every day. Anyway, sorry. Actually, um, that reminds me, as, as we were preparing, she, she, she kind of puts together the outline and then we beef it up but, um, or flesh it out. Uh, I did a search on Google for um, what is Christian service or something like that. And the first few things that came up were from um, different organizations, none of which I really recognized. One of them was Quora, which is a website where people ask questions, I think, and they get answers and stuff. But one of the answers uh, had to do with uh, serving, serving God is helping other people and making the world a safer, nicer, happier place. And I thought, you got to really be careful when you, go, when you go out to really not just the Internet, but to any resource to do Bible study and to try to learn about the things of God. You really have got to do what some of what we've talked about, which is to filter this stuff, to be aware, of false, be aware, be wary of false teachers and of false teaching. And I haven't subscribed to AI. I mean, it was just, 
Google. It just happened. Yeah. So. Yeah. So just kind of a little warning there that we, we really need to filter everything through the word. Where's my Bible? It's in the bag there. Um, we need to filter everything through the word and not just take whatever we see or whatever somebody tells us at face value. So back to the outline. How does all this work with regard to our service in the church? Seek to live a holy and godly life. Seek to learn and know scripture. Trust that God will equip you for whatever he's called you to do. Remember that we're all living stones, and as such, we all contribute to the well-being and the growth and the building up, which is the word uh, Paul uses, the building up of the church. Okay? So we're all basically working on a construction project, and we each have a job to do in that. Right? Um, and then the one, the one thing that I keep hearing is the word humility. We, we have to do that hum humbly and putting the needs of others before ourselves. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So what are some areas of service? Um, what's the VBS email you referenced? Oh, here? yes. Did anyone get a VBS email from Kevin Dunford this week? Did Asking. everybody eagerly reply? <laughs> Asking for volunteers? I didn't know everybody didn't get it. And I told Scott, I said, I'm going to ask if everybody eagerly replied to Kevin's email. He said, not everybody gets it. So I don't, I don't know what it's filtered through. So anyway. Probably those already screened. <clears throat> That's true. Maybe. That's true. Maybe. And yes, you need to be screened if you want to work with the children because that's the culture and the life, you know, the, the world we live in now. So you have to have I a think even to be like a C group host and everything. Oh, really? For C group too? Okay, so I'm going to run down this list. Uh, VBS, so you could help in VBS, right? You could be a C group host, right? Or you could facilitate a C group, or at the very least participate in one. That'll give you opportunities to serve because of a relationship, right? So you join a C group, you get to know people, you get to know their needs, and you can serve through that. Uh, Bakra is in, um, I don't know if desperate is the right word, but in it's always in need. I'll say in desperate need of children's workers. So there's a need over there. They don't have enough teachers. They don't have enough helpers. And they're trying to lighten the load a little bit so some of those folks who do work can actually go to church, right? So by serving in that capacity, you can help others grow in their own faith and their own walk. Youth ministry, music, uh, greeting. So you see when you come in every morning, there are people standing at the doors to say hello and open the door. That's a very simple way to serve. You're already here anyway, right? So maybe you have to come 15 minutes earlier, but okay. Uh, parking lot, not only um, moving over to the gravel lot, but helping direct cars and also uh, following the directions. So when Bobby says go this way, if you... If you don't have an overriding reason to go the other way, just, you know, do it. Just say, grab a lot, grab a lot. Uh, coffee, there's a, you know, they serve coffee every morning. They need people to prepare the coffee and that kind of stuff. Uh, using your gifts and talents, however, serve Frankfurt is coming up. Mission trips, maybe you can go on a short-term mission trip, maybe you can't. But if you can't, you can pray or you can give money so that someone else can go in your place. Uh, encourage one another. With with, an R. We talked about this, huh? It should have an R. Mine didn't have an Where R. is that? I don't see it. Oh, I see. Um, encourage one another with texts and calls and notes and cards and those kinds of things. I said, um, you know, when with with mom passing away, we have been overwhelmed with cards and texts, just people saying, "I'm praying for you. I hope things are going well." What an encouragement that is, you know. Um, encourage your pastors. So uh, Chris preaches a great sermon, shoot him a text, send him an email, call him the next day and say, hey, you did great. Thank you for preaching that, you know. And not only Chris, the others as well, right? Uh, yesterday, uh, Scott, Scott Reeson had been gone on a trip this weekend and got back yesterday, and I called him with a need from one of our C group people. And he had just gotten home, Catherine, is that, is that about right? And the next thing I know, he's over at their house, you know. So they sacrifice time. They sacrifice time with their family 
and we need to encourage them in that and be sure that we thank them for those kinds of things. Um, provide meals. So someone has, you know, you see the meal train thing come through. It's easy to say, I don't want to do this, or I'm not going to do this, or I don't have time to do this. But it's a great way to minister to the needs of others. Uh, send cards. We talked about that. And then even during the week, if, if you have opportunity, they have volunteers who work in the office to answer the phones, to help with administrative tasks. That's a way people can help. Uh, they have folks helping to clean the building uh, during the week. And then just yesterday, they had um, they notified the deacons. I don't think it was a wide church-wide call, but they had folks come and work on the grounds to kind of spruce up a little bit for spring and in light of Easter next week because they want it to look nice for visitors who are going to come for Easter. Um, and then you, you can, well, Marcia, you can do this, this mm -hmm. next part. I think. So if you go in Ephesians 6, at the very end, when after it talks about the armor of God, it talks about prayer. And um, in 6, 18, it says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. He uses the word all. Um, in Pilgrim's Progress, the pers there's a person called all prayer. And it comes from this verse. Um, so it's pray at all times, pray with all prayer and supplication, all perseverance. Making supplication for all the saints. That's all of us. And so we are in this, in this um, the last main piece that kind of, incorporates the armor of God, we're, we are told by Paul to pray for one another, pray for all of us. Not, and that's hard, and sometimes I think the more groups you're involved in or the more people you're involved in, sometimes the prayer list can be overwhelming. Um, and I, we've shared this. Uh, somebody went on sabbatical years and years ago, and he said, I will pray for you as the Lord brings you to mind. And so that has just, that stuck with me, and generally if anybody... If, if I'm mowing the grass and I think of somebody or somebody comes to my mind, I'll pray for them because I'm thinking that why would I? Um, there was a young woman who passed, this is interesting, who passed away many years ago. She had two young boys. And I think Armando was at the hospital visiting her and I was mowing our grass. And for years, when I would mow around this one tree in our front yard, that, that came to my mind. And I prayed for those young boys for years. Um, so, so just, just pray as people come to mind. We are able, no matter our skill level, education, age, or background, we've all got knowledge and experiences to share. Um, we can stand in the gap. There's a verse in Ezekiel 22:30, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, a little more. But um, it says. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap of, on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. Wasn't promise keeper stand in the gap? Mm -hmm. And so, but we are all, we, are, we all have gaps in our lives, whether it's relationships, family, um, needs. And so each one of us, if you know of a gap, we, have, we can stand in that gap. And then um, the... In Exodus 17, 12, when Aaron and her held up Moses' arms while he was praying during the battle, you know, we can all be Aaron and hers just holding people up during their battles. And then we can all be a mentor. So there's just, we can all serve. There are, there's no excuse not to be able to serve, no matter your age, no matter um, your abilities, no matter your education. Um, the Lord calls us all to serve in outside the church, but inside the church. Okay, we're going to play the what if game. We're going to run through these really quickly, and then we're going to come back and flesh them out. What if we are not asked to do something we think we should do, or something that we think we are good at? I think these are in your outline. What if no one really sees or knows about our service? What if we don't get thanks or reciprocal treatment? What if you think there is a ministry or activity that we should be doing and isn't being done? What if someone else is serving in such a way or in a capacity that you think you should? What if you feel you have nothing to offer? What if you think someone else has more to offer than you? What if, what's the answer to that? It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's Chris's sermon. So anyway, but um, go back to the first one. What if we are not asked to do something we think we should be doing or something that we think we're good at? God is sovereign, 
And if you are his child, he loves you, he wants the best for you. And so if you think you should be doing something that you're not and it just doesn't seem to work out, trust God. Trust the sovereignty of God in that. He has all of our best interests in mind. And so it's very easy to, um, to think, well, why wasn't I asked to do that? Um, has anybody ever felt that way? You know, if, you, if you're able to do stuff, you know, why, why wasn't I asked to do that? Um, you know, I've, I've been asked to write stuff for different things, and then there's been years I haven't been. I'm like, well, why wasn't I asked? Um, but you trust the sovereignty of God, and by doing that, it lets go of a lot of feelings. Jealousy, envy, worry. You just trust God has whatever, and he's, and he's got it. In Matthew 25, 21, and 23, um, those are the verses about being faithful with the small things, and I'll read those really quickly. So Matthew 25, 21 through 23 says, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. You know, those little things, if God can trust us with those those little things that maybe nobody sees, um, those are important. I shared a story I heard a long time ago. There was a brand new Christian, and she wanted to do something in church. And it's back when they all had little pencils in the back of the pews. And, you know, she didn't know scripture. She hadn't been in the church very long. And so they just asked, would she sharpen the pencils every week? And she did. She faithfully came and sharpened those little pencils every week. And as she grew in her knowledge of the Lord and his word, she then went from sharpening the pencils to praying for the person who was going to be sitting in the, seat, in the seats. And, that, and so, you know, she grew, but she was happy to do that, that little thing. Which brings us to what if no one really sees or knows about our service? You guys have probably seen this before. Um, first of all, let me, let me go back to Genesis 16, 13. Um, that's when Hagar gives the Lord the name, the God who sees. And don't, he sees everything. He sees those little things that nobody else knows about, that you may feel like you're just doing for naught, but you're not. You're doing them for the Lord. But I did this a long time ago, teaching some of you guys are probably there. What is this? What does a sparkler do? Sparkles. What does it do before it runs out? Who said that? Anna. <laughs> She's heard this too many times. What does it do? Sparkles. It sparkles. Don't we all want to be a sparkler? Don't you want to be able to get up there and sing a solo, you know, like Marie Bishop? I mean, just like, ah. Um, you know, or to just preach like the walls down or to teach the walls down or to just do anything. We want to be a sparkler. But what happens to a sparkler, Anna? It runs out. Pretty quickly. So we are called to be what? Here's yours. Utility candles. And what are utility candles? Slow and steady and faithful. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I want to be able to, to be a sparkler. And maybe I'll have my moments. But, but we are called to be faithful, to be steadfast, to be all those things on those, that list, which are little utility candles. So um, last week when Chris was preaching, Armando said, oh, that's the sparklers and utility candles. I'm like, I hadn't thought of that. So just be, just be faithful. It doesn't matter if you're, not, um, if you're not seen, just be faithful. And then what if we don't get thanks or reciprocity? I'm going to tell this little story. Armando's like, should you tell this? But when COVID started, I can't tell you the number of meals I had asked to take to people. I, every few days I was taking a meal to somebody. Well, I didn't get COVID for a year and a half. And when I got COVID, do you think I got a meal? No, because it was old news by then. And in fact, the Thurmans were supposed to come and stay with us, so they couldn't stay with us. But I sat on the edge of our patio outside while everybody else fed them and everything. Well, she had COVID. <laughs> and so I did, the thought crossed my mind, think of all those meals that I, I gave when I had COVID. But anyway, it's very easy to think that way. 
right? You know, look what I've done and look what I did. But that, again, who's your service for? Um, what is the purpose? And we're just supposed to encourage and build one an another up. I'm glad by the time I had COVID, it was not a big deal. But um, anyway, go ahead. I didn't cook. <laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't like my cooking. So at, we, after 40 years, almost has it been 40 yet? Um, I'm just like, why? No. Why even try? Because it it's just not going to go well. Anyway. But it was. It was funny. It was like, okay. But you have to understand, when she prepares a meal for somebody, it's like over the top. Well, it's, it doesn't matter. She just does such a great job. But you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm just I'm trying to pat you on the back because you do great. I don't need a back. No, but I'm just, I just, it was a good example of the thought crossed my mind, you know. I didn't dwell on it. No, you didn't. No, no she was good. <laughs> she was good. Okay. Um, so what if there's a ministry or an activity that you think the church ought to be doing? You are the church. Okay. That's good. Tell a deacon. Okay, tell a deacon, right? So. Don't just suggest, but be eager to lead it. Okay. Okay. But what if the, what if the church leadership comes back to you and says, that's a great idea, we think that's noble and worthy, but we, we the church, aren't going to take it on? Okay. So the word humility comes back to mind for me. And so, you know, we're, <clears throat> Marcia says, I always like to fix things. I always have big ideas and how to, how to make things better. And uh, so. Do you remember, you, serving doesn't mean fixing. Who was here for that? <laughs> right. Serving doesn't mean fixing. We have to trust that the Lord is going to do the fixing, right? But, uh, I mean, we, I think we can all think of cases where we've thought well, why isn't the church doing this ministry? Or why isn't the church doing that ministry? And then I want to I want to share an example without naming a church of uh, cases where a church is approached about a ministry and they do it. And then somebody else approaches them and they do it. And they and what what I think that leads to is a lack of focus and a lack of purpose on the part of the church. And so we need to remember that our pastors are appointed by God to lead us. Um, we trust and believe that they're um, praying and seeking the Lord's will for what the church ought to be doing. But also the church puts together, and I think Marsha's gonna talk a little more about it, but the church puts together, we have a mission statement, we have a strategic plan for the year. And so if you're kind of willy nilly about what you're gonna do and every time somebody comes in and says, can we do this, can we do this, can we do this? You're just going to be spread all over the place, and you'll end up in a, in a situation where the church really doesn't do anything well. And what's the purpose of the church? Spread the it's to the spread the gospel. So everything we do ought to be focused on that. Everything we do ought to have that as the, as the goal. Um, and we have to remember that, that the church has limited resources financially and time-wise, uh, limited number of people who, who are willing to serve, much less who are called to serve. Uh, limited money, you know, we have to be good stewards of what the Lord has provided. And so all these things come into play. So if we go and we, we suggest something, but they don't buy into it, we need to be humble and, and, and understand that, that there may be good reasons for that. And we also need to know that maybe they can't tell us all the good reasons. Or maybe they shouldn't. And maybe they don't even need to. You know? Well, and remember, God's timing is not our timing. That's so right. just because we think it, it should be done doesn't mean it's God's timing. I, regarding the mission statement, a long time ago we did a training for the Pregnancy Center Avenues for Women. And, and that training said, when, and it's kind of good for your family. We're not, this is way off the chart. But does your family have a mission statement? You know, we did one years ago. And... And so it's what, what this training said was take everything and funnel it through the mission statement. Um, I'm sure everyone in the world needs relief, right? <laughs> and, and you can't send relief to everybody. But funnel everything through the mission statement. And so for Avenues, for example, somebody asked if we wanted to buy our building. Well, our building has tenants. Well, part of our mission statement is not to be a landlord. 
And so it was very easy to get to that decision because we funneled it through the mission statement. And so, again, just trust the pastors with, with what they have, have set the course for. Okay, another what if question. What if someone else is serving in such a way or capacity that you think you ought to be serving? So they've been asked to do something in the church that you do very well. You might even do it as your livelihood. So you're an expert in that, whatever it is, right? But you're not asked to do it. Someone else is doing it. How do you handle that? Well, remember, remember what you are called to do. Remember what your gifts are. And maybe the Lord isn't appointing you to use those gifts in that way at that point. Um, trust, as Marcia said, trust in God's sovereignty in terms of what you're doing. Um, humility comes into play again. And then the, the other thought that came to mind was we're to be about, we're to put the needs of others first, right? So maybe that person needs to be serving in that capacity for some reason for their own growth, for their own edification, for their own um, well-being, you know, whatever it might be. You may be very, you might even be better than them at what they're doing, right? And more skilled and more capable. And, but the Lord has them serving in that capacity probably for a reason, and they may need that. Where you have other things you can do in other areas that, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use the word affirm you, Maybe that's a way that they can be affirmed because they don't have other areas or they have other things going on where they can't serve in these other things. So sometimes I think we're called to give up our own desire for a place to serve or a specific service to do so that others can do it and benefit from it. So um, other people have gifts as well, and we need to recognize that. All right? You want to talk about the... Were you going to read Matthew? Or? Um, oh, I can. Yes, I should. Um, Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28, if you want to turn there. Um, Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what is it you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, and Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm to drink? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father, for whom it has been prepared, been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. So we're talking to the disciples here, of course. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we all, you know, we all have this um, natural inclination to want to be first, to want to be in that seat on the right hand or the left hand, to play this role or that role in the church. But sometimes we're not called to that, and it's okay. We're called to serve in whatever capacity. And think about Jesus who was called to serve in the ultimate capacity, giving up his life, and willingly did it. That's, that's, that's one of the things that strikes me about this, the, about the, uh, the crucifixion and the entire process of the trials and everything leading up to when he was crucified, he willingly did these things. He knew what was coming, and yet he did it. And who did he do it for? He did it for me. He did it for you. Right? And so uh, if he was able to do that for us, how much more can we give up where we serve in the church so that someone else can do it? When we first came to Buck Run, Chuck Henderson was the assistant pastor. And I think this may be a false memory, but I believe that, and he had been um, Herschel's assistant pastor for a long time, and, and they're the same age. It wasn't like he was Chris or Scott or anybody. And I think Herschel taught a class at seminary about being the second violin. 
And, and so I, this may be one of the things I Googled the other day that came weird, but this, Careful. I know. Um, I thought it was just really neat. The simplest answer is to say that usually the second violins play, play a supportive role harmonically and rhythmically to the first violins, which often play the melody in the highest line of the string section. Although the two sections play different parts, all members share in the responsibility of blending seamlessly together as one unit. The second violin plays a complementary role in creating the rich harmonies that make classical music so beautiful. Remember I said stand in the gap? It often plays harmony notes, filling in the gaps between the melody notes played by the first violin. So we are, even, the, even the sparklers, even the first violins have gaps. You know, we're not perfect. We can't be all things to all people. So we're all called to come alongside one another, another to fill in those gaps, whether it's in service, whether it's in ministry, whether it's in, um, you know, just life, our families, our relationships. And, and that's not a lesser role. It's a filling in role. It's a supportive role. And it's needed to make it a whole. Armando said that's, that's why an orchestra is an orchestra. You know, you have all of these little, little things. Um, I saw something the other day. I, I think we were watching basketball. And they showed the uh, pep band for one of the colleges, one of the universities. And they showed the guy playing the piccolo. And I, my first thought was, why even bother? Because, <laughs> I mean, you can't hear it, right? I mean, has anybody ever been able to, Carrie, you're a music teacher, have you ever been able to discern the piccolo out of, out of an entire orchestra? No. But the piccolo plays an important role, right? And so my nature is, why bother? And sometimes, um, sometimes I'm guilty of thinking that in terms of service. Why bother? Somebody else can do it better. Why bother? Somebody else um, is already doing it. Why bother? They didn't ask me to do it. Right? So we get hurt or offended or feel like we're inconsequential, that we don't have a role to play, but we do. And so if, if you got rid of the piccolo, and then you got rid of the flute, and then you got rid of the cello, and you got rid of the, you know, the, the second violin, what would you have? Right? It wouldn't probably, probably wouldn't sound very good. So um, here's the bottom line. The bottom line as we close. Whose kingdom are we seeking to establish? Is it our own kingdom or God's? Right? And so I point you to Matthew 6.33, which reads, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, all the things we so want, will be added to you. And uh, so that, that's, that's a promise. And so we can serve knowing that there's a, a promise uh, that will result from our service. We may not see it today, we may not see it tomorrow, we may not see it next week, we may not see it next month or next year or in 10 years or 20 years. But there's a purpose behind it and we're called to do it because we're building whose kingdom? God's kingdom, not our own. You wanna talk about the? I am, if I can find it. Um, and I just that, I'll point back to that very first week, we had it the first couple of weeks, that every member ministry and I'll just read this one more time. Your life is much bigger than a good job, an understanding spouse, and non-delinquent kids. It is bigger than beautiful gardens, nice vacations, and fashionable clothes. In reality, you are part of something immense, something that began before you were born and will continue after you die. God is rescuing fallen humanity, transporting them into his kingdom, and progressively changing them into his likeness. And he wants you to be a part of it. Seek his kingdom. And the result will be when we die or when we go and see the Lord, those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And isn't that what we all want to hear? So. Anybody have anything they want to say, share?
help but think, if you're serving in a way that you're already above and beyond prepared for, then there's no growth in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that other person who is qualified but not as qualified as you is experiencing a period of growth. And when you're serving in an area that you feel less qualified for, you're experiencing growth now. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you're experiencing dependence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that's good. Anybody Judy? else? Micah. Oh. Um, Go ahead. And that's that whole, the, your, your servant's heart doesn't change, your work's might. Yeah, excellent. And we did talk a little bit about the seasons. Yeah, so I you're she, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, she that's great. That's great. I know what you said, and then uh, the what ifs kind of made me think about 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 6. It says, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Our job is not to fix. Our job is to do the work and then faithfully let him do whatever he's going to do with it and trust that he will. I heard a long time ago, and it was attributed to Billy Graham, I don't know if this is true, that, that it takes 100 people to bring someone to the Lord. The first one thinks they've done nothing. The last one thinks they've done everything. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just something to think about. Anything else? Ouch. And you don't officially have to be on a welcome team. Yes. So, just, okay. so, well. there's, so there's a challenge for everybody in this room. So you really should be part of the welcome team, even if you're not part of the welcome team, right? So you're sitting in church, and someone sits behind you or in front of you. You don't know them. You may never have seen them before. But, and, and this may push you out of your comfort zone a little bit, but how important is it for you to say, hey, I don't think we've met. My name's Mary. Not to single you out, Mary. My name's not Mary. Her name's Mary. Um, my name's Armando. My name's Marsha. What's your name? Um, how long have you been coming here? You know? And we talked about that at the deacons meeting the other night as well. How important it is for someone to have that positive personal interaction when they come visit a church for the first time or maybe the tenth time, right? We may not know, but there are ways. Sometimes I'm embarrassed because I'll say, I don't think we've met. How long have you gone here? And they'll say, well, I've been here 10 years. I'm like, well, sorry. So there are ways to ask the question without kind of putting yourself in that position. Um, but I think that's, that's a good word, is we all can be part of the, the welcome team by making people feel welcome. And think of times you've visited a church and no one spoke to you. I'm sure it's happened. Well, and when you and serve... How, you know, oh. what, what did that tell you about that church? Well, How did you leave? Wanna... No, I'm not. But I'm when not being, you serve someone in any way, what does it make? How does it make them feel? It makes them feel they what matter. It doesn't matter how right. you serve them. If you acknowledge someone, it, it helps them feel they matter. All right. Okay, we run out of time. One more, anybody? Okay, let's pray. Father, we come before you again. We thank you that we've had this opportunity and. Um, over the past three weeks, Lord, to just talk about how we can better serve you, 
uh, we can do it eagerly and um, see it more as an opportunity to do something that we get to do, a privilege rather than a, a burden or an obligation. We thank you for the grace you show us and um, forgiveness that you show us, Lord, in um, those times when we are not willing to serve and yet um, the way you bless us when we do. And so that's my prayer for this group today, that you would help us all, Lord, to seek to serve you eagerly, anxiously, um, to see it as an honor and a privilege to serve you and to, to really to contribute to your kingdom, to the, to the construction, to the building of your kingdom and of our, our church here on earth. We thank you, we praise you, and uh, we ask you to go with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.